Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe so you won't miss a new episode. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Tim Smith. Tim, welcome to the program. My pleasure. Nice to see you. Allow me to introduce Tim. He's a Dutch-born British businessman, a social entrepreneur. Now, he worked as an archaeologist, took an unexpected leap into the business music, worked both as a songwriter and a producer, receiving seven platinum and gold discs in rock and opera. But then he moved with his family to Cornwall, became involved in the Lost Gardens of Elan, uh, Heligan, and then he dreamt up and created the Eden Project. And his book on the Eden Project is to date still the best-selling environmental book of the century. Uh, his portrait is in the national uh, collection, so we need to find out why that is. Why that is, he received numerous of uh, uh, rewards and recognitions, including a knighthood. And now, as you are an English, uh, you, you're part of the, the English nation. We can call you Sir Tim Smith. But for this interview, we can call you Tim. Of course, Tim. Hey, thank you so much again uh, for the audience. Um, could you please begin to explain what the Eden Project is? The Eden Project is a set of domes made by, um, they're geodesic domes inspired by the designs of Buckminster Fuller, the great American architect, the strongest shape known to humankind. They are built inside the crater of a mine, uh, a kaolin mine, deliberately chosen because I wanted to find a place that was as poisonous as you could imagine. There was no life there. There was mineral waste and so on. And I wanted to create life there. And with that life, I also wanted to create a stage uh, for human uh, endeavor to demonstrate that humans are quite capable of reimagining their future. So that when you go there today, the most innovative thing is something you probably won't even notice, which is that we've made 90,000 tons of our own soil using waste materials. Um, we use a foil in our roof, which means that each of our 11 meter panels is so light, you or I could lift it up with our bare hands. In fact, the extraordinary thing about it is that the weight of the superstructure, that is to say everything above the foundations, weighs almost the same amount um, as the air contained inside it. The reason we've done that and the reason why we're having our second phase of revolutionary approach to design starting now is that we realize that our strength is in demonstrating by bringing people together that can do things as opposed to people talking about things. The world of the environment, the world of imagined futures is dominated by people who like the sound of their own voice, but do not seem to understand either the science or the systems necessary to marry these things together. And I believe the revolution we're now going into is where we come away from the binary algorithms of a mechan mechan mechanical world, if you like a heritage from the industrial revolution, into a world of systems, a biological systems-based world. Interesting that the biggest hirers of systems specialists, ecologists, are now Google DeepMind. Put that to what you like. Tim, you've immediately dove into the deep end, taking us along to what the Eden Project is. May I describe this as a living lab? It is a living lab, but the, there's a but. The intention is to be a scientific institution that is so sexy that nobody knows that they're having lessons or anything else. They just come there and they just go, wow, that's great. That's terrific. Okay, so people come there. So uh, who can visit uh, the Eden uh, Project? At the moment, 1.1 million people a year come to uh, the Eden Project, which is 280 miles from the capital of our country. And everybody said, how do you do that? Well, you see, in a world where everybody thinks it's fast, everything's got to be now. We deliberately chose to forego instant satisfaction. You can have us now. Please pay us. We're so, we're so needy for your love. We thought, let's build it in the middle of nowhere. And it will become like a pilgrimage to come to us and you will be there at our speed. And when you get there, you'll notice there's something very strange about it. It looks wonderful, but there's also no advertising anywhere. We don't allow advertising. So nobody is actually feeling all the time they're back in the normal world. 
and people relax. Only when you relax do you feel stuff. Got that. So you, as a visitor, you are immersed, you experience a lesson, knowledge you want to share, rather than you uh, read it or hear about it. You actually experience this. You experience most of it. We've noticed that the majority of people do not learn through reading while they're on a day out. They actually find it irritating. Even really intelligent people find it irritating. We have people who insult us because we do not have enough plant labels. And we then insult them by saying, we believe that you don't remember more than 10 names. Therefore, why should I make the whole place look like a funeral parlor for plants? I want you to experience uh, nature here as you might all over the world. That is why we have humid tropics, why we have a Mediterranean zone and temperate zone. And unlike a botanic garden, it is planted so that the feeling you get is of being in the, in the wild of those places rather than in some kind of um, butterfly collection of plants, you know. And I think that's really important because I want people not to go, wow, the rainforest is amazing. I want people to go, wow, isn't it amazing? Now that I'm looking at my own temperate biome, you know, I'm going into the dunes of Texel or I'm going into the wild of Norfolk or Scotland. It's every bit as exciting as the rainforest. But I never looked at it that way before. You just, you just described what Eden is today and what people who visit Eden experience. And we'll come back to that later. When did you start the Eden project? Um, and uh, what motivated you? Is that the Helicon project where uh, the gardens of Helicon you uh, were involved in? Well, sort of. It, it's very easy. One of the things about men is that they always lie about their past because they can't believe that they were quite as random as they actually were. Therefore, they imagine they see a shape and the pattern in the past, which actually probably wasn't there. I restored a garden, a very large garden, which is now Britain's favorite um, private garden called the Lost Gardens of Heligan. And it had been deserted 70 years before, um, after the First World War. Um, and um, the owner went off to live in Italy and the gardens were fenced off. And until we arrived in 1990, uh, no one had actually really penetrated the gardens fully. Um, and I fell in love with it. And the good thing was that I knew nothing about plants. It was absolutely critical that I wasn't a plant um, expert. So I got plant experts to work with me, but I was interested in the human story, always interested in the human story. And the human story that beguiled me was of this place which had attracted people to live there since the Iron Age, you know, 2000 years. But um, uh, for the last, let's say, 300, there had been generation after generation of people who'd lived their lives on this stage. And the story I wanted to tell immediately was the story of the ordinary men and women who had made these places great, rather than the story of the lords and ladies. And at that time, 1990, there was not one garden, not a single garden in Britain, where they were telling the story of working men and women. They were all about lords and ladies. It was the British disease of the past being a better place. And let's talk about aristocracy. Let's talk about our betters. Now, the really interesting thing was the moment we restored this garden with a huge number of volunteers and there was a, 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 a documentary which won the award of documentary of the year telling the story of the ordinary men and women and how two-thirds of them had died during the first world war that's why the gardens had eventually closed because the owner was so sad to have lost so many of his people but the thing that was really moving was that people who didn't go to gardens loved Heligan because we started to tell stories about plants and about people which weren't full of Latin names. You didn't have to have a tweed skirt or belong to the National Trust. And the visitor numbers went crazy. And then people started to want to have their ashes scattered there. To date, over 400 people have had their ashes scattered at the Lost Gardens of Heligan. And Heligan is voted regularly the nation's favorite garden. And last year or the year before, it was voted the, the, the nation's treasure. Now, it is a, an incredible privilege to be involved with something like this. And you realize that you are a steward, you're not an owner. But the real thing that I've taken away from this is, well, two things. One is people want to feel things. Most people are lonely. Most people have a feeling that they haven't got a sense of place or a belonging and or even a sense of meaning. 
And it's all very well having a, a, a media world which is all full of bright lights and everything, but most of us don't live in bright lights. Most of us are quite fragile. Most of us actually just want the warmth of conviviality and doing things together. And it was that experience of building a team that was amazing at, at, at Heligan and um, led me to dream about doing the Eden Project. Now, the Eden Project is huge. It was £144 million. Pounds. But I realized immediately, and that's the purpose of the, our conversation today, that if you want to do something enormous, do it really big. Who wants to go and see the second biggest greenhouses in the world? Who wants to see the second biggest collection of plants in the world? Who wants to be led by people who don't shock you? The biggest rock bands, the biggest um, environmental groups, whatever, they all come to Eden, but it's deliberate. So are people. you stating, Tim, that uh, what Eden is today, that was already in your original dream? My original dream was to get together the biggest collection of plants ever gathered in one place that are useful to humans and to demonstrate that humans can overcome the worst dereliction, the worst state of the land. Um, my, my slogan right at the beginning was, give me your poison. I love your poison. And that is all the, all the Eden projects all over the world that we're now engaging. We've got 17. They're all on land that is damaged because the feeling that people get when they come to a place that was previously without hope and they see it as if, as if you were the prince that kissed the frog that turned into a princess. It is really emotionally uplifting to do that. And even cynical people, you know, are, are, are moved because everybody loves a great story. And this is all about storytelling. Okay. Now the, I see the element of storytelling. I see the role of dreaming big. Now, I would assume a lot of people in the audience would like to know the answer to the following question. How do you turn that dream in reality? What's the first step you need to do to once you've had an idea, okay, this is what I want to do. How do you get there? First thing you need to do is to not lie to yourself. Too many people I know want to be supported by others and they're not very good at what they do. The first thing you need to do is an audit on yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, what am I good at? Am I a good engineer? Am I good with business? Am I a good storyteller? So and so, so and so. You will not build something really big if you do not understand money. Do not make the mistake, the arrogant counterintuitive mistake that you are an artist, therefore you are above money. That is one of the things, when I was in the music industry, I used to have so many arguments with the, the guitarists. It was always the guitarists. Who, hey, man, I don't want to know about royalties. I'm just a guitarist. And you say, well, in which case, starve. You know, you've got to be a responsible person to understand it. So once you've done an audit on your strengths and weaknesses, which I did quite early on, I don't want to be lonely being a loser. I want to be with people who know what they're doing. And I then worked on If I am walking, this is a really good test. If I am walking into a room with people who are critical, who don't necessarily love me, what are they looking at to find my weaknesses? First of all, they will want me to be a kind of hippie bloke so that they can say, no, he's just a hippie bloke. You don't want to go with him. Or they will want someone who only talks about money. Um, they'll think that, oh, well, we quite like that. That's quite good. This is a business proposition. The thing they cannot resist is someone who understands money understands project management and knows how to do the love bit. It's really interesting. So, so in my case, I got a very good finance person and a really good project director who had built motorways, power stations, art galleries. You need someone who can answer all the questions. Never, never, never make the mistake of thinking you have all the answers. You have got to be your own Spanish Inquisition before you go out. And most people are pathetic at the way they do this. They don't test themselves nearly well enough. Is that something um, which you realize yourself or have you had some kind of external influence to realize I need to do this? Do you have a role model and example? Um, well, one of my heroes was Brian Clough, the football manager. Um, and Brian Clough created one of the greatest football teams in history out of people who were basically misfits. They were mostly people who were going to have a great future who just didn't have one because they blew it. And he gathered them together and he said, 
If you listen to me, I will make your dreams come true. So all these players that thought their best days were behind them came and played for Brian Clough and they rediscovered the genius that they had before. And I think if you were to ask me my greatest gift, I don't have many, but I'm, I'm good at one thing and I don't know anybody as good at me, as me at, at it, which is I can make other people believe in themselves. And I think that is really, really important. It is you've got to create a sense of redemption for people who are really good, who thought their best days were behind them. And you need a mixture of older people and younger people. You need young people because they don't know it can't be done. Therefore, they will just go for it. But you need older people because they feel so excited to have one last chance. And you will often find that younger people have not been brilliantly parented so the older people then become kind of like almost parental to the younger people. So you start to create a real family vibe about what you do. And that's very, very important because you've got to want to go to work. You've got to want to actually dream and support each other. I believe you can do this, are doing this. And the results actually, uh, Sean, because if you look at what Eden has contributed to the Cornish economy, it's so, uh, almost uh, two billion pounds. So that's... Uh, huge uh, contribution uh, and it's interesting to see if you look at well, hey, what, what's Eden it, it first stays uh, what uh, Eden has done from a financial perspective then it stays Eden is proud of his success in changing people's perception yeah. uh, is that, so is that a deliberate choice the first name the accomplishment Does that, uh, is that related to what you first said you need to understand money otherwise you're going to be, be a very poor broke guitarist I hate owing people money. I hate more than anything owing civil servants money. Um, and there is something very cool about putting your own money on the table when, you, when you're successful. I think one of the problems that social enterprise has had across the world has been this childish thing that making money is somehow dirty. Um, making money, money if it, in a social enterprise, if you're brilliant at running a social enterprise, is embodied energy that enables you to do more and more good things. The issue is not that you've made money. The issue is that the, the money is a benchmark of your success. <laughs> Where you then spend that money is your business. Um, so for us, I mean, we, the real reason, going back to social enterprise and why people who are social entrepreneurs should listen to Eden, is that we are very, very political. We insisted... When you talk about life-changing moments, I went in ni 1997, I went to a place called Ebu Vale in Wales, where they had got, um, uh, uh, they had a huge flower festival funded by the government and it was a failure. I went up there and I spoke to the people who'd organized it and I will thank them to my dying day. They were honest about what they'd done wrong. And they said something which is so profound. They said, our problem was when we came to Wales, we saw the whales in our imagination. We didn't see the real whales in front of us. So, for example, they saw the imagined whales of coal mines and singing and steel and all the rest. But most of that had already gone bankrupt. So Wales was actually a country of a lot of two people and a dog companies. So when they put all these millions of pounds into Wales and then did the commissioning of work only six months before it was due, none of the people in Wales could compete. They couldn't do it. So almost all the money that was meant to be going to Wales hemorrhaged outside as they had to bring people in. That's so Eden, yep. Eden, we started commissioning people two years before we needed them. And we offered them long-term contracts. You must listen to this, long-term contracts. Because if you really understand business, you know that if you make ice cream and you, Eden Project wants to take your ice cream, you will not be big enough to supply us. And if we only give you a short-term contract, the bank won't give you the money to grow, to have the capacity to supply us. So if you're going to be a really, really good friend to business in a, in a region, you've got to think about the needs of the people that are supplying you, the quality controls they need in order to get bigger markets than you. Because if you're a friend, you also don't want to have them completely dependent on you. You want to create bigger markets. So I think that's the biggest thing that Eden has done. And that's why we, we're doing 17 projects around the world, because all these cities are coming to us saying, we want a project that understands how to generate jobs. 
And we generate a lot of jobs by being really focused on the needs of the people who are going to be working for you and the suppliers and so on. And the way the world is going now, I mean, you know about this, Fritz, but we're, we're getting to the point like we're about to build a hotel at Eden. Yep. And we've set ourselves the target that we're going to build a, a world-class hotel using materials that we will have obtained within 30 miles of that hotel. Now, that involves us using clay, pounding clay, creating new materials and the rest of it. But it's funny, everybody tells you you can't do stuff until you're unreasonable. And you say, well, you're bloody well going to do it. And then suddenly people find you can do it. So many hooks in this uh, story, uh, Tim. I don't know wh where to continue. Uh, I think the, the first, you are a social entrepreneur. Um, I would say that that would be the perception of the people listening to this. Uh, but what's your definition of a social entrepreneur? Let me begin with that question before I ask my other question. All right. I have stopped defining a social entrepreneur because I've been so angry with social entrepreneurs who expect people to think <laughs> And an awful lot of social entrepreneurs I know are incompetent and they're asking for our support. It's a bit like people who work for charities. Oh, you should yeah. love me because I work for a charity. Yeah. No, I should love you because you're solving a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think we've got to stop mollycoddling social entrepreneurs and we should demand that if you're going to try and do maximum impact with what you do, be a professional, understand what you're doing, really understand what you're doing and don't expect everybody to love you because the cause is a good one. Eden, I prefer to look at it as a business that just happens to have its shareholders as its stakeholders and the trust. Are you with me? Yeah. We want to run like a proper business. I believe that if you are a really good CEO or chairman of a social enterprise, you ought to be able to run any business anywhere in the world up to the scale of your, your experience. But um, I, I've become less and less forgiving of wanting... It's because I've, I've been a social entrepreneur for so long and when you go to those award sessions, after the fifth year of winning a prize, right, you should say, wow, I'm really glad I'm winning that prize. After a while, though, it feels as if you've entered a football league in which everybody's so rubbish, you're winning all the time. I don't want that. I, 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 want, I want the critique of knowing that the standards that are being set are absolute. It doesn't matter whether it's money or the amount of welfare or well-being, but they're absolute in terms of you've done the very best that you could have done with those, those tricks. And I think that one's, one of the really good things about your, your web show um, is an awful lot of people who could do so much more are not brave enough to be unreasonable. And because they're not brave enough to be unreasonable, they waste year after year after year of their lives doing things they already think are possibly a waste of time, but have never been brave enough to put in the dustbin. So one of the lessons learned I'm picking up from this again, what you've uh, said earlier, is that self-assessment, go out and walk and um, really assess what your strengths are. And once you know them, set the bar high to uh, make as much use as possible of what you're able to do. Yes, but you will be brutal. So when the New York Times tells me that coming to Eden is education by visionaries, yeah. Yeah, I know it's not. I know we're not that good. And what's happening is because everybody else is so bad, <laughs> we're getting massively overrated. The real test is, have people changed their lives through being with you? Have people got a dream of a new future that still remains theirs to make? For example, are they going to change the way they live? Are they, you know, a whole list of things. And the truth is, most of us don't want to ask those questions because we're rather frightened of the answer. It's quite difficult once you draw the conclusions to take the consequence of that conclusion because you might want to um, see what's happening, but actually then... Uh, acting upon that, that's an all different ball, different ball game. Well, being unreasonable yep. does not mean, so for example, if you have a small social enterprise and currently your vehicles are diesel to supply something to homeless people, don't change your diesel vehicles as some tokenistic thing for buy very expensive electric vehicles, which mean that you can't then maximize your impact with homeless people. You know, there's got to be, you've got to work out where your moral... Uh, backbone, uh, backbone, where is the moral uh, framework for your decision making? The priority, if you're a homeless charity, is to look after homeless people. And then as that goes better, you hope that other people will help you do that as sustainably as possible. But your first 
in triage terms, the first obligation is to make sure that no one starves on the streets or no one gets too cold. And then actually probably the ultimate aim is that everybody has housing or whatever. So I'm making that up as yeah. I go along. But the, the thing about impact, it's really interesting. It's like universities. I, yeah. I have so many enemies in the university framework where you have all these universities all over the world have become corporations and they do all their res a lot of their research based not on pure curiosity but on what grant giving organizations will pay them for and if you want to really really annoy a vice chancellor at a university ask them for a list of the senior academics that were promoted because they were brilliant teachers they will make goldfish impersonations because the truth is it's become like champions league football they're just trying to buy academics that come with research points and we live at a time look for it we're living in a time where probably over the next 20 25 years there's going to be some really serious change in the world and people who are leading that world need to lead that change by e e example and the universities still seem to think that they're living in a world of you know four-year research projects and that will lead to something that will take 30 years well fry on your own please okay now, uh, is Eden Project uh, for you an example of how the world is going to change, or uh, is, is that a separate uh, discussion, separate entities? I think the world is already changing unbelievably fast. The trouble is the media are so slow to pick up on it. The media has not picked up on the speed of, say, um, clean meat, you know, uh, artificial meat. A $1.9 billion turnover last year. It's going to be double this year, and China is about to invest huge amounts. We've got issues with fermentation technology, which is going to make food cheap. At the moment, all across Europe, we're talking about expensive food. Mm -hmm. But fermentation technology is going to make food production available to even the poorest of people. Um, and when you see the electric vehicle and then the, the hydrogen revolution that's coming behind that, the way that cities in China where we're working they're already talking about how to turn their cities back into villages as they don't need so much tarmac for cars. And yet, sorry, we're, we're, we are literally riding the horse of revolution and we've become like hypnotized by present day consumption. And the revolution is going to be about citizenship. Is this something you observe as an individual uh, watching what's happening in the world? Or is this also something which is part of the EDA project? I can't tell the two apart anymore. Uh, when it, in March last year, I read um, uh, in, in 2020, I, I reread um, Buckminster Fuller's astonishing book, uh, An Operating Manual to Spaceship Earth, which read, when I read it, it was as if it had been written today. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was talking about being unreasonable. And from that moment on, we are being really unreasonable. We, we, we're digging up our sewage systems at Eden and we're making them circular and we're going to breed fish with the nutrients. We're going to grow vegetables with the nutrients. We've, we're just building a 6,000 uh, square meter series of research greenhouses. Why are we doing that? Because over the course of the last six months, we've dug a hole 5,378 meters deep because we're going to have a, an energy revolution at Eden using deep geothermal. The temperature, by the way, is 187 degrees centigrade down there. And we're going to bring that heat up and do a lot of stuff with algae, um, a lot of stuff with novel crops. And with solar, we're going to be not only completely energy independent, we're probably going to be able to heat 34,000 houses around us. I want to be the example of the revolution that's going to come, and it's going to be muscular localism farms are going to change with what they grow they will be able to become supermarkets feeding where they are rather than these giant supply chains of stuff all over the world it's amazing the biggest question though the biggest question for social entrepreneurs is is if i am right and i am almost certain i'm right it means that within 20 to 30 years the whole notion of what nation states means is going to call into question as you get effectively in europe and america you'll get a really muscular federalism where each town each city will have its own um control of of, of, of supply and demand of goods you will have 3d printing uh, we we're as partner partners with volvo at eden they're sponsors of our vehicles and they agree with us that probably within 10 years 
they won't even have a supply chain for their parts. They will have 3D printers all over the world. And if you need a part, it would be printed near you. And that is amazing. But it's going to completely transform the world we're living in. And so, yet, sorry, go on. Yeah. No, 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 no. But my conclusion is um, based on all your examples of what's happening uh, in Eden, uh, you demonstrate what, how the world is changing and people can actually see that and experience that there. Uh, yes, we are behind the story I'm telling you. We're actually, well, the, the deep geothermal is now going okay. into place. The big greenhouses are going into place. The sewage is being dug up, but it's not all yet. Well, the world is going to be fit about systems. That's why your work uh, and the work you've done is so important because actually communities, real communities, what it means, communos, together in gift, is about active relationship it's not about a line on a map and you count up the people inside it i, I know you know that but um uh, I, I realize this is something i tend to talk about myself as well this is a shift from command and control to connect and collaborate yeah the, the technology is helping us to do that but as humans we tend to be lagging behind that uh shift uh because we have to change our thinking of what we identify as success by the way, so a couple of questions at the end, uh, Tim. Um, what does success, success mean for you? That my kids think I'm a good dad. Good. That's good um, enough. Uh, the, the truth is, like any male, I've got, I've got this battle going on between my personal vanity to be recognized and my knowledge, my self-knowledge, that it's a craven thing to want that recognition, so pretending I don't want it. So I, I'm, I'm consistently battling with my, my own vanities. And I guess um, success, su I'll be really serious. Success for me at the moment would be that if I die, well, I will die, obviously, but if I, if I died, the people will regret that I've passed, but I will successfully have let go of the reins of control so that other people share the dream and have the confidence to then make it their dream not an enslavement to any dream they think i had gosh that was a long answer but no one has the right to curse the future with the sense you notice there are so many movements that are in the name of people who've died and then everybody it it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's christianity or islam or whether it's rudolf steiner um, people then slavishly want to then interpret what the past meant and what the great people thought without any reference to what they'd have thought had they been alive today. I'll give you a really good example. In Holland or in Germany or in Britain, uh, heritage. You know, we restore heritage. Like, I was so criticised at Heligan for, for, for the way that we gathered the plant supplies and we looked for it everywhere. And they said, you've got to make it to the year 1817. It's got to be historically pure. I then said, do you know anything about gardeners? And everybody said, what do you mean? And I said, well, a head gardener of that period was a scientist and their greatest pleasure and excitement was waiting for the seed merchants in the autumn to sell them new varieties. So you're telling me you want me to make the spirit of the head gardener somebody that's just stuck in treacle for the rest of their days. That is ridiculous. It's a form of slow death. So we went forward, and then 20 years later, the National Trust have followed, which is good, really. Now, I'm sounding arrogant. I shouldn't do. I, I, I Forgive me for that. I just, no, I just get impatient. No, uh, it, it's not arrogant. I think what I'm hearing is somebody who is um, thinking about things, uh, but also educating uh, themselves, because if you make the assumption that gardening is about preservation and you need to have continuously the same plants there, if that's your assumption, uh, then you go down a path you just described or warned them for. So it's understanding the, co the historical context where it's coming from. I think that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing you telling the audience, uh, invest in your own knowledge if you um, take an, a, 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 in an endeavor. Yeah. Always question. Yeah. Always question. And also trust your instincts and by trusting your instincts i mean there are certain things people's instincts actually are often very wrong about a lot of things but there are certain types of instinct which are about the right thing to do the right spirit with which to go for it um, that you must listen to 
it's just like be really careful about your first instincts of people are uh, people i never trust people to say i instantly made up my mind about that because almost all my best friends are people i didn't like when i first met them they were difficult they were spiky and it really repaid the effort to get to know them and as i said to you socially i think one of the greatest things you can do to yourself is to own your very own mountain stream to go through your brain on a regular basis to wash away your prejudices because the problems we all suffer from are that the the desire to find information that supports the prejudices you have we, it's, it happens all over the world um but it means that you think you've got an open mind there's a great piece of graffiti as you travel into wales across the seven bridge someone has sprayed on an industrial building some open minds should be closed for repair and i think that's true i think and it's as true for me and you as it is for other people um it's the same if i look at my friends uh, environmentalists i work with i i sometimes metaphorically want to weep because in order to get the attention of the world's press we ourselves are fibbing about certain problems so that we can get the scary headlines so we can get the whatever and it's become a battle for attention rather than a battle for truth and that becomes very very dangerous because then it becomes that everything is about opinion and there's no difference between opinion and a belief um except the words but so we were talking before before i began about how then what what would be the greatest gift you and i could give anybody looking now it would be probably to give someone a tip i've often said this to audiences what i'm about to say to you you should be paying about a year's salary to hear just the few sentences i'm about to say now because it has changed my life it has changed the direction of travel that i i i go in and other people who copy what i do have told me that their life has been transformed beyond belief before you now switch off thinking i'm going to be some religious guru it's not that i decided at the age of 37 that i was going to accept every third invitation i received unless it clashed with a family obligation it's not that i don't accept the first but i always accept the third and the reason for that is i was fascinated by how can you put yourself in a situation of social jeopardy that as opposed to meeting the people that people think you need to meet you meet the people you didn't know you needed to meet because who who in their right mind goes to a dog show i had to i've been to west of england dancing championships i've been to flowers i've opened an old people's home and every meeting i go to i meet people that i wasn't meant to meet that transform the way i think and you know directly as a result of that the funding for the eden project was finally caused by me speaking to 50 people and a dog in a shed near Taunton in Somerset 180 miles away i was told by my pa that i shouldn't do it i went and did it 3 months later i'm standing in a room in plymouth in devon where the european commission are making a decision as to whether which projects in the southwest are going to get money the eden project was going to get nothing it was really obvious and suddenly this old man got up he said my name is humphrey temple and I'm the chairman of Somerset County Council and 3 months ago I was in a shed in Taunton hearing this man speak I am convinced he has a love for the wider west country not the narrow confines of Cornwall and I've spoken to my colleagues and we have dropped one of our projects so that the Eden project can go ahead after which each of the counties dropped one of their projects and we got 12.7 million pounds because I spoke at a shed in Taunton and it happens time after time after time the third interview the third invitation the third invitation and don't please it out be honest with yourself the, tr the the truth is that when you get an invitation from friends of course you go when you get an invitation from professionally important people of course you go but getting an invitation to something you don't want to go to that is interesting tim uh that's I think uh, I cannot know how to end a better way uh, this great, great talk and discussion with you. And I'm so honored uh, that we happen to be the third invitation for you, you which you accepted. So thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. My pleasure, Fritz. I hope our paths cross again. 
Thank you for listening to the brand called You Video Cast and Podcast. A platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.